All right. Good to have everybody here this morning. We're going to pick up a brand new study today. And uh, I guess, I guess, I don't know, title it creation. The only thing I can think of is just uh, bara. That's the Hebrew word for it, creation, to create, to bring into being what uh, was not before. Father, in thy holy name, Lord, give us understanding in your word. Give me the gift of teaching. And our Father, give us hearts to receive the truth, Lord, our Heavenly Father, to ferret out the truth from the multitude of lies we are fed daily. We pray this in Jesus' name, and for his sake we ask it. And amen. All right. Now, if you'll turn to the book of Genesis, chapter number 1, get that in one hand, John, chapter number 1, in the other, and Colossians 1, in the other hand. Amen. <laughs> I'm about to run out of hand. Huh? <laughs> All right. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. This was written 3,400 years ago by Moses. And obviously Moses was not there in the event that he records, so it had to come to him from a source uh, that reached far beyond him. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, the beginning, of course, has to do with the beginning of creation. In other words, the beginning when God began to create. The Almighty existed from everlasting. He's eternal. So there has been no place of beginning with God uh, from everlasting to everlasting, eternal being. But he created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1.1. All right, now that's a salient passage. When I say that, it simply means a salient passage means that this is a foundational truth. If you cannot accept that foundational truth, then the rest of the Bible is just going to be relative to you. Take what you want, throw out the rest of it, so forth. God created the heaven and the earth. Now, the word God translated here is Elohim. And that's a plural Hebrew noun. It's not his name. It's simply a generic term like an Englishman, like we say, God. Uh, that simply means a infinite, supreme uh, creator being, an almighty God. His name, as revealed in the Old Testament, is the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vau heh jehovah We pronounce it. Some say Yahweh. I stick with Jehovah. Now look at Matthew. Look at John one one, the Gospel of John, chapter number one, verse one. Now notice in in Genesis one one, how much are you told? You're not told a lot, are you? And you're not really told. Uh, you're not, and you certainly aren't told anything about the reason why God created. It's simply He created. Now in John one one, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was the beginning with God, all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. All right, Him who? Who's the Him? Well, we know that, but who, in the text, who's it referring back to? The Word. All right, the Word. The Word, therefore, is the Creator. So we are a little more specific then. Moses told us God created, all right? John tells us the Word created, all right? And then, of course, John tells us in what John chapter number 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that tells us even more. That tells us it had to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians gets into much more detail about the creation and why the creation. Look at Colossians chapter number 1 and verse number 16. Colossians 1.16. All right. The Apostle Paul, being a, a learned Jew who knew, knew exactly what Genesis 1.1 said. Gen he had Genesis 1.1 in his lap. He had read it from a child. said this, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, Visible and invisible. So therefore, we have a world of invisible things brought into being. That tells me that even though I can't see it, I cannot deny its existence. That opens up my mind. That allows me to understand that the creation is much larger than the physical creation. See? The creation is much larger than the physical creation. The creation gets into the realm of the invisible. 
which therefore, as far as our laws of science are concerned, is not physical. So the apostle says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. And then he gets into a little more specifics. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, and all things were created by him, and note what he adds here, and for him. Now, in the book of Revelation, chapter number 4, and verse 11, the apostle John uh, uh, reinforces that statement by making this statement. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Yeah. See that? Now therefore we have a reason for the creation. God just didn't decide one day while he was bored to create and bring into existence. And then after he did it, he said to himself, My goodness, this would be a good place for man to dwell. So we'll make man. So forth and so on. No, God's God. And He never has had a thought. He's never had an idea. He knows all things in a, in a sense that we can't even comprehend or understand. But now the Bible tells us in the Old Testament that God created. Elohim, all right? Elohim did the creation, did the creating, all right? We know that's a generic term. We know there's no name attached to it. There's no specific identity attached to it in a simple sense. God. Then the Apostle John tells us in John chapter number 1 that the Word did the creating and the Word became flesh. Well, then we know from that we can connect the Word with God and we say the Word is God and therefore the Lord Jesus Christ is God by, by those two statements. And there's far more than that. But then we get further into the, into the book of Colossians written by the Apostle Paul and he tells us that they were created by Him and for Him. And then the Apostle John in Revelation tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Creator and He created it for His pleasure. Now, something jumped up to me the other day and I just out of the clear blue and slapped me across the side of the head and said, Now, dummy, listen to something. <laughs> I said, Yes, Lord, what is it? He said, Have you ever really considered why God created this universe as it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ? I said, well, you know something? There's something there, isn't there? Yes, there is. He created it for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Redeemer. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Redeemer, so therefore the first creation, because there is another creation coming. And the other creation, the Bible says, a new heaven and a new earth, and Peter says, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Then the new creation will be for the redeemed. So the first creation was created by the Redeemer for the Redeemer. So when we look at it in that sense, then we ought to be able to see the marks of redemption and the Redeemer as it relates to the first creation. And I believe we will. The first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, that's very important. The reason I say that is important because it's the foundation of the Old Testament. If you can do away with the inspiration of the Pentateuch, forget the rest of it. It's the, it's the foundation. If you can throw the Constitution of the United States out the door, then there's chaos in this country, and uh, every man will do that which is right in his own sight. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy have been attacked. They were attacked in the 1800s in the, in the schools in Germany, and uh, which called higher criticism, schools of higher textual criticism. The Graf Wilhausen theory became dominant. And in it, they felt like that at least three, four, maybe five different people wrote the Pentateuch. And they have J, and they have P, and they have this one, and that one, and so forth, and so on, redactions, and what have you, and what have you. This is not a study in all that foolishness. But the bottom line is, by believing that, the average Bible student that goes off to a Bible college that's taught the Graf Wellhausen theory comes out do not believing that the Pentateuch is inspired, and certainly don't believe that Moses wrote it. One of the popes a few years back said that Adam and Eve was a myth. And the reason he said that is because he was schooled in the Graf Wellhausen theory of the documentary hypothesis, it's called. That's, what he's, that's why he said that. He does not believe that the book of Genesis is historical. It is historical. Right. He does not believe that the, the book of historical, it says God created the heaven and the earth. The book of Genesis is foundational. 
because it has it lays forth the foundation of why God's relationship with man is in the mess it's in right now. Because man fell. The book of Genesis, therefore, becomes foundational in the sense that it teaches everything that is built on later in the Bible. You must have the foundation. You can't build without it. And so the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. But the second book in the Bible, the book of Exodus, has a theme that runs through it. From chapter 1 all the way through the end of the book, it has a theme, a dominating theme. And what is that? Redemption. Somebody said it. Redemption. It is the theme of redemption. So no longer, no sooner is God, uh, has God written the first book of the Bible than He comes out with the major theme of the Bible. Redemption. Redemption means to purchase back, to buy back. And uh, the third book of the Bible is Leviticus, or Leviticus, or the tribe of Levites, the handbook of the priest. The third book of the Bible is the handbook of the priest. It taught him how to offer sacrifices and how to approach God, what God would accept and what God would reject, what was clean and what was unclean. The book of Leviticus, therefore, becomes the foundational book and all of the books that follow as far as the sacrifices are concerned. You couldn't have them without Leviticus. Leviticus teach, taught the priest exactly what he had to know to approach God. The book of Numbers, as the, as the book implies, is the numbering of Israel. It has to do with their wanderings. It has to do with their 40 years in the wilderness. It has to do with their rejection of the covenant promises and the payment they made. The whole generation died but for Joshua and Caleb. Then the last book of the Pentateuch, the last book of the Pentateuch, which is the foundation of the Old Testament, is the book of Deuteronomy. And the word means the second giving of the law, Deuteros and Namas. It's a conjunction of two words, second giving of the law, the law that was given at Sinai. Therefore, it binds Israel to their relationship with God in law throughout, the old, throughout all of the Old Testament. So as I say, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy become foundational. It's the very heart and soul of the Old Testament. Take it out and the rest of the Old Testament is nothing but conjecture. What is, as the book of Judges was, every man will do that which is right in his own eyes. That's anarchy. And uh, that's uh, you can't you, you with anarchy there is no rule of law and there is no civilization. Right. Period. It doesn't exist. You must have the rule of law in order to have civilization. All right. So we have a creation that is designed around the Creator and uh, the Creator as the Redeemer. And that's quite a remarkable thought. Because the second creation undoubtedly has to do with the redeemed. Say, so why do you say that? In the book of Revelation, when you find a new heaven and a new earth show up, the first thing that it talks about is the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven. That new Jerusalem is the Lamb's bride. It is the city of the redeemed. That city of the redeemed comes down out of heaven... And it abides above the earth, and the nations that are saved walk in the light of that city of the redeemed. So therefore, the new creation has to do with the redeemed and what God's going to do with them. And He does intend to do something with them. Amen. He intends to do something with them. Now, when we read the Bible, in Psalm 19, verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. I'm going to show you how in the heavens God had already given the declaration of redemption. It was about redemption. The message of the Old Testament was about redemption. This is Kenneth C. Fleming's book. There's a number of different books available on the subject. And his book is entitled God's Voice in the Stars. Now, he says this about a scholar of the 1800s in her study of the stars. I'm going to quote, read from page 13 of his book. The biblical, biblical fact that God named the stars is remarkable. Isaiah chapter number 40, verse 26. He named the stars. Now, if He named them, therefore, it wasn't some uh, inconsequential explosion and an expanding universe where no star had an identity and everything is just a mass chaos to begin with. And that's the world that they teach you in the public, uh, in the public fool system. School system, sorry. <laughs> that, it, that it's just chaos, right? 
Really, I mean, that's the way people live. Do not people live their lives as if it's nothing but chaos? There's no order. There's no direction. No purpose. But anyway, I don't want to get to preaching. Let's just stick, stick with the text. Isaiah chapter number 40 says he named them. Now, the book of Genesis ch- says that Adam named the animals. He named them. He named the animals. And, uh, for example, uh, look at the animals, the names that, uh, that are attached to these animals. You can trace this back and you'll find out these names go back into antiquity. For example, the name a giraffe. Everybody knows what a giraffe is, don't you? How many believe that name giraffe means long neck? They've got a long neck, but that's not what it means. It means swift. It, obey, it would amaze you. You'd be very surprised to find out how fast a giraffe moves. He is so big that when he moves his leg, like you'd move your leg six inches, he's moving his leg 60 inches and the same effort. And that uh, it applies to all of the animal creation. Adam named them, and he had a reason for naming them. And Hebrew was very practical. They named according to what they saw or a prophecy from God. But in any event, God named the stars. Now, why did he name them? If he named the stars, Isaiah chapter number 40, there must have been a reason for that. See? Why give them a name if, it's, if it doesn't mean anything? See? So therefore, if God named the stars, then we can trace that back into the beginning. Right? Yeah. Certainly. And all you have to do then is to find out, as this scholar did, let me read. Just let her speak for herself. Biblical fact, God named the stars remarkable. He left the naming of animals to man, but he himself gave meaningful names of the stars. These names were important to God because of their prophetic significance. In the middle of the last century, a scholar of ancient classics, a scholar of ancient classics and history of language was struck by Psalm 147 verse 4. Subsequently, she spent much of the rest of her life delving into the root meanings of the names of the stars in many ancient languages. That's smart. If God named them, then there, has, there must be a common source. See? This scholar, Francis Rolston, published a work in 1863 entitled Maseroth, in which she traced the meaning of the stars and the signs of the zodiac. Her work was popularized by J.A. Sice in his book, The Gospel and the Stars, published 1884. And by E.W. Bullinger's work, The Witness of the Stars, published 1893. Look at all these works done in the 1800s. Which was published in Britain. Rolston discovered many roots of a primeval language which has survived the changes of history and are still apparent in ancient and even some modern languages. She found that similar words in different languages express the same basic idea. And she assumed that they came from a single source. And her assumption is correct. Such words were most often found the names of stars and constellations. If God named the stars, these names have been around a long time. For example, the brightest star in the sky is Sirius in Canis Major. The word came from the ancient root Sir, which means a prince. The Egyptian Osiris, the Hebrew Sarai, princess, Sarai, princess, you know who was Sarai, God changed her name. The same name as Sarai, the Etruscan Asar, even the Indian Aswara, all come from the same root. We still use the word sir in English, as well as many other languages, a term of dignity and respect. In this way, Miss Rolston traced the names of over a hundred stars and found in them the great prophetic story of biblical redemption. That's amazing, isn't it? Let's put some of that together. A common source of the names of the stars. A common message in the names of the stars. Now, folks, you know, that just doesn't happen. There has to be a... There has to be an intelligent mind that's creating this and putting this out there. And also, it, also it, it, it declares this to men. God wanted men to know. He wanted them to know what was happening. Now, I just picked this book up a half hour ago in my office. Just a half hour ago. I didn't even have this when I did my study. But I saw that and I thought, what's this guy going to say? 
flip to it and right off the bat, he's saying the exact same thing that God gave me. It's the message of redemption. That's the story. When you start in the constellations, 12 of them, the first one is Virgo. The last one is Leo. All right. Virgo is the virgin. Leo is the lion. You run the circle of time, start with the virgin, and end with the coming of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation 5, 5. Hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. In 1400 B.C., Moses wrote the Pentateuch. But was God's word manifested before Moses wrote the Pentateuch? Look at the book of Job, for example. Let's look over at Job. I want you to see something here. The book of Job, and as I've said to you time and again, nobody knows exactly how old Job is, but we know that at least he was a contemporary of Abraham, which put him about 1900 B.C., somewhere along in there, all right? So the book of Job is written with no Bible in the world, all right? No Bible exists. It does not exist in written form. In the book of Job, chapter 38, verse 1, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? My goodness. <laughs> In other words, a talking head has no clue where it came from, where it's going, or the effect it's going to have. <clears throat> Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. I've got a question for you. That's the way we'd say it today. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Uh, declare if thou hast understanding. Duh. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? In plain words, it has its bounds, its reasons for being where it is, exactly where the stars are located. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Duh. They used to think that the earth sat on the back of a huge tortoise, or Atlas held it up, or something of that nature. They thought it was flat at one time. They certainly did. They told Columbus, you'll sail off of the end of the earth and fall off into nothing. And they, they feared that. But you know, the Bible says the earth is a circle. Right. Amen. Right. And when the morning stars, now go back to verse 6, whereupon are the foundations fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Amen. Yeah. That cornerstone yes. not only is a physical thing, but it's prophetic. When the morning stars sang together, who's the morning star? Who would this be, folks? Who do you think the morning stars? They predate the creation of the earth, obviously, as you can see. Now, was man before the earth or was man after the earth? Did God make man before he made the earth or did he make man after he made the earth? After, obviously. So these morning stars, therefore, are not men. They must predate men. And obviously they're angels. When the morning stars, notes carefully, sang together. Isn't this amazing? And all the sons of God shouted for joy. He let them be an audience to creation. Boy. <laughs> so therefore he made living beings before he made physical things. Is that, not, is that not what you get from this? Yes, he did. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it breaketh forth, break forth, when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and thick darkness, a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. My <laughs> goodness. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. And from the wicked their light is withholden, the high arm shall be broken. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea, or hast thou walked in the search of the depth? Have the gates of death been opened to thee, or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Hast thou perceived the breath of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. God says, you want to argue? Come on. <laughs> Present your case. <laughs> <laughs> where is the way where light dwelleth? Man, that's a good one. Because we know that light's a ray. You know what a laser beam is? A laser beam is, 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 in, is, is intensified, concentrated light. And it moves. It's moving. Light is moving. And it is headed in a direction. So therefore, it's not coming from every direction. It's coming from a certain direction. 
Where is the way where light dwelleth? And for darkness, where is the place thereof? That thou shouldest take it to the bound thereof, and thou shouldest know the paths to the house thereof? Knowest thou it because thou wast then born, or because the number of thy days is great? How long have you been around, he said? <laughs> oh, 150 years? Is that all? <laughs> oh, you've lived 969 years, Methuselah. <laughs> You're just a baby in diapers. That's, that, that's, what that, that's what that means. Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? Plain words, God said, I have things in waiting right now that haven't even been discovered that will appear at the right moment when the battle of Armageddon takes place. That's what that means. By what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? Who hath divided a watercourse for the overflowing of waters, or a way for the lightning of thunder, to cause it to rain on the earth where no man is, on the wilderness where there is no man? In plain words, an awful lot's going on that you don't know anything about. You think, you think man's the center of all things. To satisfy the desolate and waste ground, to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth, hath the rain a father? Or who hath begotten the drops of dew? Out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven who hath gathered, who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. What deep? When the fountains of the deep were broken up during the time of Noah's flood, more happened than simply rain falling from heaven. The fountains of the deep were broken up. When the Lord Jesus Christ went back to heaven, he went through water. Yes, he did. He went through water. Yep. And just recently, man has finally discovered right. there's a pile of water up there. Right. Now watch this carefully. Canst thou bind the sweet influence of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? These are old names. Pleiades, Orion, Maseroth, Arcturus. These are names that were written 4,000 years ago almost. Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? In other words, the cycles of time of heaven. Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? Canst, canst thou lift up thy voice to the clouds that abundance of waters may cover thee? I want to take one, Orion, from this book. Just one, Orion, of the twelve constellations. It's full of stars that have names. Every single name has a meaning. He has a hypothetical situation here where the descendants of Adam were teaching their children about the stars. So this is we're going to pick up on this. It's a hypothetical situation, you know. And uh, here's what he says. Orion is to remind us of that coming glorious prince of light. In one hand, he holds a great club and in the other hand the skin of a slain lion. This shows his victory over the roaring lion who is Satan. At the feet of mighty Prince Orion is the serpent. One foot of the prince is raised to crush its head. The bright star that marks that foot is called Regal, which means the foot that crushes. The star in the other foot is Saif, which means bruised. <laughs> bruised? The very word that God used in speaking to the serpent, you shall bruise him on the heel. Now the attention of Enos, this is the hypothetical little story, the attention of Enos is drawn to the bright star in the shoulder of the figure, the shoulder of Orion. The name of that one, Seth continues, is Betelgeus, which means the coming of the branch. The branch? Have you studied the branch in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zechariah? Which means the coming of the branch. While the name of the star in the other shoulder, Bellatrix, means swiftly destroying. The branch will come and swiftly destroy. And he has his foot above the serpent. Al-Nitak, the right-hand star in his belt, means the wounded. What a prophecy, my son, of the triumphant prince, wounded but coming in power and great glory to crush the enemy of our souls. Now here I ask myself a question. You say, well, there's no truth. You say there's nothing to that. 
Well, then, where did it come from? Where did it come from? If there's nothing to it, why so much connection with the Bible and prophecy? And remember this. This is so very important. What I read to you from the book of Job, chapter number 19, was written about the same time that Moses sat down and wrote, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You see, Moses did not, well, some speculate he could have, but I don't know. Nobody knows who wrote Job. But uh, the Job is old, folks. The book of Job is very old. It could be older than Genesis. The reason we don't know, we don't know. If we don't know, we don't know. All you get is speculation. But it is certainly ancient. And in the book of Job, it is clearly has the names of constellations and stars. Why? And why does Job include it in Scripture as if God is speaking first person and asking this individual, what about these stars? What about these names? What about what's going on here? See, you have to deal with that. And, of course, I have no problem dealing with that because the Scripture says in Psalm 119, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Night after night uttereth speech, day after day. It's speaking, prophetically teaching. But now back to the subject. The subject is, it's about redemption. It's about the coming Redeemer. It's about the one who's going to come and finally do away with the power of the devil. And God wrote that in the heavens. Now, these, uh, these uh, wise men, we don't know how many there were, but we know that they came from the east. And uh, a lot of speculation is that they came from what's modern-day Iran, or at the Old Testament time, it was called Persia. Well, the, the dominant religion in Persia was Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism. Every nation had its religion. Every religion has an element of the truth. Okay. When you go back and trace them, they'll have an element of the truth. And when I say element, I mean they have a little bit. They have a little bit. Just a little bit. But without divine revelation and without inspiration, that little bit gets covered up with a bunch of junk. You see what I mean? I probably every Indian in, this con in, in, in North America, Eskimo, uh, Middle America, South America, Aztec, Inca, Maya, and all of them, Practically every Indian believed in the great spirit. All right, the great spirit, the great spirit. All right, That's, is he a spirit? Is he great? Certainly. Is there a whole lot more to know than the great spirit? Certainly. That's what the Bible's about. But the point is, they seem to have a common understanding. If you have a common understanding, that demands a common source. A common source demands a revelation. If you have a common source, you must have a revelation. In other words, it started somewhere. If you have a common source, where did it start? Who put it there to begin with? Where did this knowledge come from? How did they know this? And that's the, and that's the point. The point simply made is that God Almighty wanted mankind to know from the very beginning He needed to be redeemed. And He wrote redemption in the, in the heavens and then He wrote it in the book. And the first book of the Bible that has to do with doctrine... Real doctrine is the book of Exodus because it has to do with redemption. He redeemed them. And if you'll notice, the book of Exodus is loaded with types. Who's Pharaoh a type of? He's, he's a type of the Antichrist. He certainly is. He energized and powered by the devil. Uh, he has a false prophet who performs miracles, doesn't he? To counter the miracles of the man of God. And when he brings them out, when the Lord redeems Israel, what does He have to bring them through? Water. He has to bring them through water. He has to bring them through water. And when the Lord Jesus Christ started His earthly ministry, He went through water. He went through water. He'd been in the wilderness for 40 days. And uh, uh, he, uh, that was after the water, but He brought Him through water. He brought Him through water. And the water, at the water, God's Spirit came down and said, This is my beloved Son anointed him. So therefore, there are so many connections between the book of Exodus and redemption and the ministry of Christ and the message of the heavens. The first creation, therefore, has redemption marked all over it. Redemption. That's quite a thing. Because uh, the Bible says that it was made for him. Right? So when the Lord Jesus Christ created, and he's the creator... A lot, of, a lot of Christians don't know that. Right, it's true. 
A lot of Christians can't make any more of Jesus Christ than a glorified man. And that's a real big problem. A lot about his humanity, about 95% about his humanity and 5% about his deity. That's what you get in most churches. The Lord Jesus Christ is Revelation chapter number 1 and verse 8, I think it is. Somebody look that up and read it for us there. I think it's verse 8, Revelation 1, 8. And you'll see what John called him. What have you got? Yeah, but it's even past that. The Almighty. The Almighty. El Shaddai. He's called the Almighty. See? There's only one Almighty. There can't be two. <laughs> they cancel each other out. All right? You can't have but one Almighty. You can't have but one Almighty, eternal, absolute being. If you had two, neither one of them would be. Right? See, the Almighty. Revelation 1.8. So He's the Almighty. He's the Creator. Yep. So therefore, what did He create? What's going on in His mind? Think about it for a minute. The creation from the hand of the Creator was for Him, but it was for redemption. That's the thought that came into my mind. That's the thought that's been eating me up now for about three or four days because I'm just scratching around the surface here with it right now with you. See, there's a whole lot more here than, than what we've covered. I've just covered some... All we've done this morning is just look at some surface areas that point to it. What's going on here? For Him and by Him. Creation. Redemption. The, cre the, re the Creator when He made it. He made the stars. He made the moon. He made the sun. He made, all, he made the universe as we understand it, as we know it. And the uh, truth of me, you don't know the truth of the matter. I really don't. Uh, it really doesn't bother me a whole lot <laughs> about how big it is. Did it bother you last night when you went to sleep about how big it was? Do you realize that all the stuff that's going on up there, and there's a lot of stuff up there, and there's a lot of beauty up there. No question about that. Don't want to belittle it. But the truth of the matter is it has very little effect on who you are and your life. What's going on right here on this earth right. is going to affect where you're going to in eternity. Right. Okay? Right. right. All right. And, but that's also the message. That's also the message. Because he says that something about a throne and something about a footstool. What did he say? What was it he said about the earth? It's footstool. Now, in almost, it's almost like the Almighty has taken man, stuck him here, and limited him to be here. And he's not going to get out of here until he gets the issue settled of sin and redemption. Once he gets the issue of sin and redemption settled, then he's free to go to the ends of a new creation. Because he's not going to let you carry corruption, perversion into the ends of the universe. He's not going to let you do it. He's going to contain it to this spot. Now, how far have we been? Just the other day, you know, 1969, they, they've been making a big deal here. It's been the 40th anniversary. What happened 40 years ago? Uh... Some say, well, that was a desert out there in, uh, in, uh, in Arizona that they filmed all. <laughs> <I don't... laughs> I don't care what it is, folks. There's a conspiracy theory about it. I guarantee it. I don't care what happens. I don't care. I personally believe they went to the moon. <laughs> How do you know? They brought moon rocks back. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. I believe, I believe it. I do. Uh, it cost a pile of money. All right, what did they accomplish? When John Kennedy stood up and said, we will put a man on the moon by the end of this decade. All right, he didn't live to see it. But what, what's the point? What's the point? All right, to explore. All right, we explored the earth, but now there's part of this earth that's never been explored. As a matter of fact, more than one part of this earth. The depths of the ocean has never been explored. There are jungles on this earth that, have, that, is, that not, have, haven't really been explored. Okay? Uh, um, Boto, mom, mom, what's its name? Motobongo. Uh, there's a name of a creature in the yeah. depths of the jungles in Africa that looks like a brontosaurus or one of the sauruses. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And the other day they sighted it again. Just the other day. And it's supposed to have died out millions and quadrillions and zillions of years ago. But it's still on the earth. See, still on the earth. And also out here in the ocean, still stuff out there. 
In plain words, we don't even know what's here yet, and we're headed up there. You see, the point is, it goes all the way back to Nimrod. What did Nimrod say he wanted to do? What was the point? He wants to elevate himself above the earth. That's the idea. Why does he want to elevate himself above the earth? Why does man want to get off the earth? Why does he want off this earth? Because it's cursed. Do you realize that this is the biggest floating graveyard in the sky? <laughs> I mean, you get off at a distance, and I've seen the photographs of earth, and it's beautiful, folks. It is. I mean, it's a sight to behold. But, uh, you know, you're looking at multiplied tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of graveyards and that everybody on that earth is going to die. The earth and everything on it, earth dwellers, are going to die. The earth is nothing but death. Man wants out of it. He wants off of it. So he'll fly himself to the moon. Now they're already talking about heading to Mars. How many decades it'll take? It'll take a pile of money. They'll have to wait till this recession's over with. But they're headed to Mars. You know what they're trying to find when they get there? Don't you know what they're looking for? All right, and what's the first thing they're looking for to find life? What is it they keep talking about all? What is it? Water, 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 water. Wasser, as the German says. H2O. Water, water, water. So what do they want to find life? Now, what I'm dealing now with is the motive, okay? We're dealing with their heart, attitude, and the motive. God's already told you. I've, to I've, I've showed you already what... What the heavens are about, what the message is about, what it's, it's redemption. But what's the heart motive? Why do they want to find life? All right. Okay, now, here, what, what, what would they have if they had life? They'd have, they'd, have, they'd have something going on that the Bible didn't say anything about. Something bigger than the Bible. Something greater than Scripture. And it's out there. See? We're down here. We're here. We're stuck here. There's no way to get out of here. Except one. Somebody from up there is going to come down here. And he's taking us out of here. Up there. <laughs> That's the message. See? He's not going to come down here and make this a better place to live. He's coming down here, get you, and he's taking you out of here. They're trying to do what God's going to do Amen. when He comes to take His children home. Amen. Why? What's so wrong with it? Here's the problem. They've got something stamped all over them. It's in their, it's in their, it's in their nature. It's, in, it's, it's called S-I-N. And God says, you're not going to take it up there. I'm going to keep it down here. Amen. Yuri Gagarin got up there and he looked around. And uh, I think he was the first cosmonaut. Maybe not, anyway. They got up there, and this atheist looked around, and he reported back to Earth, back to Moscow, and he said, Well, I've looked the place over, and there's no God. And boy, they, rejo they rejoiced and jumped up and down and had a big parade down Red Square, and boy, they had a time over there, didn't they? There's, do what's that, brother? <laughs> he didn't go far enough. There's a third heaven, isn't there? There certainly is. <laughs> you go as far as you can through the physical heaven. You go to wherever it is. I don't know how far God put this thing. He did. I'm not worried about it. But you cannot get into that third heaven with a rocket ship. Okay? You can't do it. In Revelation, though, now look how this works. See, now we're talking about a book written thousands of years ago. Didn't know anything about airplanes and all that. John said, I saw a door. Open in heaven. All right. He's in heaven, all right. John's seeing the stars flying by him. Here he is. Man, this is a beautiful place. This is something else. But he said, I saw a door open in heaven. In plainer words, right before his eyes, all of a sudden, mm -hmm. what John saw was the entrance into the third heaven. And the third heaven has to open in order for you to go into it. The third heaven is not a physical heaven like this right here, but it is more real than this right here. And the Apostle Paul said, I knew a man in Christ above 12 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, cannot tell. He was caught up into the what? Third heaven. 
So the Scripture has something to say about a place that is not like this place. Amen. And that Russian cosmonaut that's an atheist, will lived an atheist, probably died an atheist, but he's not an atheist now. Right. Atheist, a temporary attitude. Right. <laughs> That's just a temporary theology. There are no eternal atheists. They all get converted real fast. All atheists. You want to make one mad, you tell him that. <laughs> yes, sir. God doesn't believe an atheist? <laughs> That's pretty good, you think about that. We run out of time. <clears throat> we'll pick this up again next week, uh, Lord willing. <clears throat> the first creation is by the Redeemer for the Redeemer. The second creation is by the Redeemer for the redeemed. That's the difference. Brother Peach, dismiss us, please. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for the study, Lord.